good to see this good number out and I hope we'll have a service today that will be pleasing to the Lord. Our first song is number 308. 308. In vain and high and holy lays my soul, her grateful voice would raise. For who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. A joy by day, a peace by night, in storms of calm and darkness light. In pain of all in weakness, might is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. My hope for pardon when I call, my trust for lifting when I fall. In life, in death, my all in all is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. 464, <clears throat> 464. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. And empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross the river life <clears throat> by no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see glory and I know he reigns because 
because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Let us take a moment to be silent, to remember what the Lord has done for us this day. He's given us life day after day. We have to learn to appreciate all the great things that He has bestowed upon us. We know that he is the giver and the taker of life and death. We know, Father, that uh, those, there are many that, that know thee not, and we ask, Father, that may we be that light that goes out forth and shows others the way to, to your life. We ask, Father, that you be with the sick if it be thy, be thy will, Father, that they, they, you reach your physician's hand down and heal them so that they may return to us. We ask, Father, that uh, you continue to bless Wooddale and all that are here, here in and uh, be with those, Father, that we know that could not make it today. We ask, Father, that as we, we uh, bring the word to you today that somehow, some way that it may reach out and, and touch somebody. And Father, we appreciate your love for us that you gave your son. May, may his spirit dwell in us and may we be refreshed in, 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 in his word. We ask Father that you be with us as we go forth through the rest of this service be with this great country of ours. And we ask, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. And welcome, everyone. We're glad that you're here. Several of our members are not. You can look around, still at home because of the virus, but there are others who are battling health issues and, and uh, going through times of grieving. Get a bulletin if you haven't already, and uh, you can see our present list 
of those who um, are battling these health issues and those that are on our daily prayer list. So do that and do what you can to help provide the support that they need. Good to have everybody here. Good to see friends from the past here. Uh, good to have a pretty good number considering what's going on. We've uh, maintained numbers in the high 60s and low 70s for the last four, five, six weeks. And don't know how long it's going to be before uh, things start turning, to talking to a couple of people who work at hospitals. I know several weeks ago it seemed like the numbers of people affected by the virus in Knox County have peaked, and the numbers are starting to go back down the other direction, which is certainly encouraging, but we're probably a long way from being able to get back to normal. And we need to be praying daily for those affected by the virus and for our country. I know a lot of things are going on that some other country never thought that they would see. I certainly haven't. This is a time when we need to be prayerful and diligent in the Word of God. Yesterday we had a men's business meeting to take up matters of the church, and some of the things we talked about in that meeting was the desire to be evangelistic, even while we're limited in our influence. Well, several months ago, one of the good things that came out of the virus was our, our ability to speed up things, ratchet up our involvement to be able to tape sermons and have a means whereby we can take care of that. And so these sermons are, are taped, and we want to be able to uh, advertise that. You know, we're, we're going to start today what I call a, a series of sermons back to the Bible. We agreed yesterday to just begin presenting for a while Bible fundamental sermons back to the basics. Who are you? Well, what's the Church of Christ about? Looking at the plan of salvation, looking at worship, looking at the distinctive nature of the church. Are we just another denomination? No, we're not. What are we trying to be? No, you can't live right unless you know right. And so we need to know right. There are people who now realize that government is not the answer to all the issues that confront us. In fact, the government someplace seems to be part of the problem. Where can we place our foundation on what rock? That rock is Christ. And as we mentioned before, maybe on the part of some who may not in times past have given very much diligence to the study and dedication of God's Word or looking around to make changes. And hopefully what they'll do there, they will hear and see you and see a heart that's on fire for the Lord because it's been made that way because of a righteous faith that comes from the Word of God. We need your help in getting the Word out. Now you can't go out, and we can't. We've still got about three dozen names of people from the community that we met this spring when students from the School of Preaching came and helped us in that door knocking. We don't think it would be received quite readily yet until restrictions are lifted to go out there in the highways and byways. We're still restricted in that. But we're not restricted in sharing our faith. And so what we hope that you will do, especially beginning with these lessons starting today, is encourage your friends and neighbors to get on the website. You know how to do that. There's a, all the sermons, our videos are being prepared and placed on that website through our YouTube connection. And so this will be a means whereby you, first of all, you know, can learn. Now, it's one thing to, to hear a 30-minute sermon on Sunday. Another thing to go back and look at the notes. And beginning tomorrow, the notes that I present to you on Sunday, I'm going to be posting as articles so you can confer with that. In fact, I've got a number of sets of my notes that uh, if you want today, I've got 10 sets. I'd be glad to share with those of you who want that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. We know that. And that's the way that it works. And you'll not have a strong faith unless you get your mind and heart into the Word of God and study and meditate on those things. Find the application in your own life and be able to live thereby. Let me mention one person that's not in the prayer list. Talk with Wayne earlier. And our heart certainly grieves for the loss in family as they agree the loss of Kevin. His funeral service was conducted Thursday night over at Asbury and had a great turnout for that. But uh, Lori Lawson for the last uh, several years has been facing uh, increasingly difficult health issues. And going to the doctor the day, they're fearful. He said, you get all the, the symptoms of MS, multiple sclerosis. <laughs> That's a horrible and dreaded disease. And so she's soon going to be uh, uh, having tests d done to confirm that and see what course of action they can plan for her. So add her to the prayer list, if, if you will. 
I mentioned to some of the brethren yesterday that we can start out basics and do a lesson on the, like the Lord's Supper. Well, we did that. One of the first lessons that we taped was on that subject. And so what are the subjects that are available? For those of you that keep up with uh, current events, those of you that keep up with uh, religion and how it's going, there's probably no more favored subject and in interest in our country over the last 20, 30 years. And I'll give you a fancy word. How many of you are familiar with the word eschatology? <laughs> well, that's the doctrine of last things. What's going to happen at the end of the world? And people today, a lot of people believe we're at the end of the world. People have been for a number of years back in the early 70s. A man by the name of Hal Lindsey wrote a book, The Late Great Planet Earth, which he began uh, predicting the end of the world or things transpired that would start the, 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 the millennial reign. He said it would be in one year in the late 1980s. Well, that didn't happen. He's revised things still on the cable network. But outside the Bible, that's been the most purchased religious book in America. And so the influence is there by him and others looking at the thousand year reign, the, the rapture, period of tribulation, and things like that. What does the Bible say about that? What does your Bible say about that? If you study the Word, you can get answers to that. And so that's what we want to do beginning today. And I, I've told people that if you really want to understand the book of Revelation, a chapter that would be helpful, providing a foundation for that understanding, would be the book of Matthew, in particular Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, Revelation chapter 20, and a few chapters in Daniel are what I call the happy hunting ground for those who subscribe and make known those doctrines. And so for any chapters we need to know and understand well, it would be those three or four chapters. And so we want to begin today looking at Matthew chapter 24. Because when things begin to go through what I call a major upheaval, people begin to put, well, there's signs of the end times. And that comes from Matthew chapter 24. Well, what are those signs? Because that's something we should be looking at. And so <laughs> it's a Bible question. It deserves Bible answers. To be able to fully appreciate Matthew chapter 24, as in most subjects, you need to know the context. And so we really won't get into Matthew 24 per se, we'll set the table for it so to speak, by looking at what precedes that. The basic tenets of premillennialism assumes that God still favors the nation of Israel. Because God does that, even though they didn't do too well before, then they're going to be brought back and then Jesus is going to establish a, a, a literal reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem again. But I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 24 and what precedes that, the attitude of our Lord towards the nation of Israel. What have they done? I think about a lot of people that I've studied with are surprised by what happened and how degraded the view was of religious hierarchy in Jerusalem in Judea at the time. Let's begin with a passage that was read in your hearing earlier by Bill. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Now Matthew chapter 24 is the culmination of a series of prophecies against the Jewish nation. I say against the Jewish nation because a lot of people out there that are not very privy to the scriptures think Jesus was a go along, get along kind of guy. He loved everybody. It accepted everybody's beliefs and convictions as they were. That's not the case at all. He was crucified and put on a cross because the religious hierarchy of that day hated him. And that's a strong word, but that's true. They hated him. They despised him and saw to it that he was crucified. And of course this met Old Testament prophecy. God knew what was happening, allowed for that to happen, and planned for that to happen. But I want you to notice the beginning of trouble for the nation of Israel. It starts with the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist. So in Matthew chapter 3, let's start with verse 1 and see what the ministry of John the Baptist is all about. And there will be a lot of reading today. And hopefully get your Bible out and follow along. Again, I'll give you all the notes that I've got on that. If you want them, we'll be posting articles online that might have more information than uh, the notes that I have here that will help you in understanding. Verse 1, Matthew chapter 3, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah, in other words, gave a prophecy about John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way, be the forerunner of Christ, if you will. Now, verse 4, John was a very unique individual, including his dress and demeanor. Verse 4, now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Where would they get the idea they needed to confess their sins from the preaching of John the Baptist? He said, the time has come that you need to repent. And they were willing to do that and make confession of that. But when he saw, look at verse 7, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Pharisees and Sadducees were two of the major ruling religious sects in Israel at the time, the, Sa the Sadducees were a more liberal sect. They were up in the, the hierarchy. The Sanhedrin was pretty much made up by people of, of the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Very liberal is what we'd call them in their views of the Old Testament. And then there were the Pharisees. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, notice what he said. Brood of vipers. Now, vipers are snake. In other words, he said, you bunch of snakes is how he addresses them. Who warn you to flee from, notice the word, the wrath to come. What's that about? Well, we're going to see that this morning. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, notice this expression, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now long before we had all the power saws, axe, axes were the very means by which trees would be cut down. If you saw a tree that was old, a disease, dead, or dying, you could see that tree and an axe laid up against, you knew what was going to happen. If that axe is laid up against that tree, that tree is going to come down. And so that tree that he's talking about is a warning to the nation of Israel, especially to the hierarchy, to the religious leaders of that day, because they were not bearing fruit. So I want you to understand what was the beginning of Jesus' ministry by John the Baptist warning, and this is the first warning, if you will, towards the religious hierarchy of that day. God was not happy with them. Wrath was coming was what his message was. Matthew chapter 21, turn with me there. And Jesus in that last week in his life in his public ministry arrives in Jerusalem. He makes what we call a very triumphant entrance. His entry, he was acclaimed. Now not too many days after that, Israel will be saying, let him be crucified, release Barabbas instead of him. But as that week begins, it looks great. And we'll look at the response of the religious leaders to that. They hated that reception on the part of Jesus. Verse 1, Matthew 21. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus said to two disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. Immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. By the way, this is how they would welcome a king, someone in authority, someone who'd accomplished some great thing like vanquishing another nation. They'd reserve that for the king or generals. To be able to give them the claim, the glory for what they'd accomplish. They give Jesus that kind of reception. Verse 9, Then the multitudes who went before, and those who followed, cried out, said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
And when he had come out to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So on this day, on this occasion, things are looking great. Most of Jesus' public ministry was up in Galilee. There were times he'd come to Jerusalem. But now the greatest teaching uh, by value and intent and purpose is going to happen now, the last days. I want you to notice what Jesus did when he got there. Some people think that, you know, Jesus always got along with everybody, kept a smile on his face. But there's a term called righteous indignation that's needed and deserving of people when they blow it big time. And they had as it came to temple worship. Look at verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Most of you that know about the Jewish economy and worship realize that, that Jewish males were required to go to Jerusalem three times every year and offer sacrifices and give money into the treasure of the temple. Those of you that have ever been overseas, you will know if you're going to be there for a while, you need to exchange your money. When I'm going to Canada and a few Navy patrols were sent in Scotland, uh, spend uh, f about a month totally in South Africa. First thing you do is exchange your money. There's, a, there's an announced money rate of exchange. Like we went to South Africa, Jerry Hogg and, and others. You know, here's the American dollars, and there's a going rate of what the South African currency would be. And it would be fair, you know, ahead of time. But anybody ever noticed something back when America lacked fuel? Anytime there was a fuel crisis, how long did it take for gas prices to go up? I mean, even though the oil was already, <laughs> the gasoline was in the tanks, the next day what happens? Things may go up 30, 40, 50 cents a, a gallon. You, anybody know what the term gouge means? <laughs> I mean, that's what they do. They take advantage of it. Well, these people were professional gougers. They would come in, they would look at your sacrifice to see whether or not it was acceptable. They'd look at it and said, no, no, that's not going to work here. Well, what am I going to do? Well, we've got some, we, well, a dove God will accept. Here's the price. Now, it would be far beyond what a dove would be worth. And your ex rate of exchange on the money, certain money went into the temple. You didn't have that money. You could exchange it. Talk about being gouged. I mean, these people were making money hand over fist in the name of God. Jesus saw that and it repulsed him. He cleansed the temple and said why he was willing to do that. Verse 14, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But, look at verse 15, here's an idea, here's a snapshot if you will, of the Jewish leadership of that day. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out of the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. So here's Jesus seeing the response of the Pharisees, the, the rulers of the day, they hated it. They despised the attention and the fame that Jesus was receiving. It made them so mad, even though they were witnessing good things, it wasn't good to them. As they saw Jesus' popularity rise that day, they despised him. He was the Messiah, but not to them. So I want you to notice here the character, or lack of character, if you will, towards the religious hierarchy of that day. And then Jesus does something, kind of an object lesson of what was going to happen to Israel. Look at verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it, found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And the, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Surely I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it will be done. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believe in you will receive. Here's an object lesson. God made things to be born and to grow and to bear fruit. 
That's the way it is in everything, with the trees out of the field, with seeds, with crops, and with people. When people become part of the Lord's church, when salvation has come to them and to their house, God expects that life to grow, that family life to grow, the congregation they're part of to grow, because God made things to grow and to flourish and to be vibrant, to be alive, and when it's not, that goes against the very design and nature of why God put something on earth to begin with. And here, here's an object lesson. There's a fig tree not bringing forth the fruit. He cursed it, and it withered and died. That's what God does to things that are not living out their purpose. Verse 23. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, what was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, well, why then did you not believe him? If we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. Caught him in the horns of a dilemma there. They didn't know how to answer that. So they answered, Jesus said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. Here's confrontation that's going to mount up. And he tells this parable for a reason, which is kind of a prophecy of what was going to happen to the nation of Israel. But what do you think? The man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, But were the first. Jesus said to them, Surely I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Now talking about an insult to these religious leaders who despise the harlots and tax collectors, Jesus said, these people here will find salvation in the kingdom of God before you ever will. He's talking about the religious hierarchy of the day. They despise Jesus and his teaching, and Jesus is exposing them. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So Jesus is pointing out and giving reasons why the religious hierarchy had failed the people, had failed to follow the, the word of God. And then a powerful parable to drive home Jesus' feelings in regard for the, Jew, for the Jewish hierarchy of that day. Here another parable. There's a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leaned, leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. But last of all he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dresser saw the son, they said among themselves, This is his heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vine dresser comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Notice verse 43, if you will. One of the key verses in our discussion thus far. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them, and he was. When they sought, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. And so that, there we see uh, what's going on in chapter 22. We see the confrontation, the controversy increasing. 
the nation of Israel, the leadership has been exposed for what they were, what they were not. And to quickly look at Matt, at Matthew chapter 22, just outline it for you. We won't take the time to read it in, in a sermon this morning, but please read it on your own. Person after person come to have a, a talk with Jesus, thinking that they might embarrass him. And nobody's ever going to embarrass our Lord. Beginning with verse 15 and going down to verse 22. There's conflict with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Jesus exposed them for what they were. In verses 23 down to verse 33, there's conflict with the Sadducees. Jesus exposed them in this conflict for what they were. Look at verse 34, though. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, well, how then does David and the Spirit call him Lord, saying, and he quotes an Old Testament passage, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. These are hard times. This is controversy. This is conflict of the highest order. And Jesus is pointed out point by point what the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians had not done. And then Matthew chapter 23 contains the most scathing rebuke ever recorded in all the New Testament from Jesus to the religious leaders of that day. Notice what he says to those who think Jesus never got upset at anybody. Well, they haven't read Matthew chapter 23. We'll look at certain points to it and then draw the conclusion at the end of chapter 23. And that'll be a good understanding, a good foundation, if you will, for what Matthew 24 will deal. Verse 1, Matthew 23, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' feet. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works. For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They take the phylacteries abroad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogue. He's just now getting warmed up. Look at verse 13. Woe to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive the greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He begins in verse 15. Verse 16, woe to you, blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple, he goes on. Look in verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all unclean. Jesus is mad. Jesus is upset. He's listing an indictment after indictment against the religious hierarchy in Israel in his day. Look at verse 32. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Verse 33. Serpents. Brood of vipers, in other words, you're a bunch of snakes. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? 
Therefore, indeed I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that, notice what he says, verse 35, that on you, he's talking to the nation of Israel, the religious leadership of the nation of Israel, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Notice verse 36. Here's a time stamp, if you will, of when this judgment, this condemnation, this destruction would come. Now surely I say to all of you, all these things will come upon this generation. You wouldn't have to wait. You're going to read about that in the next chapter, Matthew chapter 24. It's the reason why we've taken the time today to look at the foundation, of, look at the context of what happened in Matthew chapter 21 and 22 and 23. It's a crescendo leading up to this conversation. All of this destruction will come upon this generation. Verse 37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, Stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look at verse 38. For those who think the Jewish nation was still favored by our Lord at the end of his public ministry, see your house is left unto you desolate. Have you ever seen a house just left up to the elements? Well, the weather, sooner or later, it'll overcome that house. The weeds will grow up. The tree limbs will come down. I mean, it's sad to see a house or a mansion once beautiful, but now in ruins, desolate. And that's the word that our Lord used for the nation of Israel. Here's a question. <laughs> Why? Of all nations, if the Lord would choose to come back on earth, which he's never going to do, why of all nations would he choose Israel? Because of what they had done. Because of the impending instruction. And so with that as a background, we read Matthew chapter 24. So we see the great destruction foretold but what would happen to Jerusalem? Most of you are familiar with the, the Bible history. No, 70 A.D. Jerusalem was leveled. The temple was leveled. What Jesus promised came true in that generation. 33, I mean, some people make about a four or five year correction. But along about 30 A.D., Jesus made this statement. Forty years later, the hand of judgment came down upon Jerusalem upon the temple and wiped it slick. Why would God do that to a favored nation? He was doing that with a message in mind. It's really a carrying out. I have a verse in John, where John, the first chapter, said, He came to His own, and His own received Him not. That's been going on for 2,000 years. Don't tell me. Jesus favors the nation of Israel. They rejected the Messiah. That they've got the right God, Jehovah God, but they missed His Son. John 1 begins, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten the Father, full of grace and truth. And when He was there in their midst, they killed Him like they'd done dozens of prophets before, and as they would do to the church. Why would God take a nation that's so despised, the people that he sent, and like the landowner, someone that would kill the son of the landowner? What do you think the judgment would be? In Matthew, in Matthew chapter 24, you find out when and where the conditions of all of that. So to understand Matthew chapter 24 with these three chapters preceding that, understanding that, we see the promise of impending doom. And understanding that makes Matthew 24, understanding that, a lot easier. This is not a popular sermon. Who wants to hear a message of destruction? No one likes to hear that, but folks, that's reality. 
People have been rejecting our Lord and His gospel for 2,000 years, beginning with the nation of Israel. Most people are not aware of that. What you believe and accept and live by is important. Jesus made the statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man will come to the Father but by me. John 8 verse 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Later on, in Romans chapter 10, you can look at it in detail, I'll give you the gist of it. Paul's prayer for Israel is that they might be saved, they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge, because they have substituted their own righteousness for the righteousness of God, and it would not or ever will be accepted. You can't take your own plan. God's plan is right here in this book. Everything that we ever need to know to make it to heaven is right here. Every relationship that you can have, especially the first, the one with our God, everything you need to do and know and live and share is in this book. And so we begin today a series of lessons back to the Bible. That's what Wooddale needs to hear. That's what this county needs to hear. That's what this state needs to hear. That's what our country needs to hear. As much as it ever did, who's going to tell it? It falls on us. And if we don't, shame on us. It would be sad to have known the way of truth and to not share it. What excuse will we give our Lord then? It's no excuse. <laughs> if you believe it, live it and share it. So we ask you to use what influence you have this coming weeks and months, the Lord tears it is coming. Tell people to get out of line. Show them how to do that. This may be a lesson they've not heard before. And most people that, you know, buy into that because that's all they've ever been told. But those verses and those, those concepts that people have imagined and thought and now believe and stake their lives on does not come from this book. It doesn't, there's no biblical basis for that. And people looking for the truth, there's still a good soul there. They'll know that when you show them that. So we're putting information in your hand that will first help you have a faith that's solid as a foundation on the Word of God. When somebody says, what's the Bible say? We hope the day will come when you can show it. And those things you have learned to be willing to share. Before we extend the invitation, bow with me if you will. Holy Father, we know we live in a in wicked times, we know that our country has still so much good to offer. We know, Heavenly Father, that people have become despondent and become depressed of what's happened in our country. Heavenly Father, they need your message more than they've ever needed it. And may we rise to the occasion and be diligent as we can and, and realize that the challenge that's been issued to us is still there. That if we will go with you, go for you, with your word in our hearts and our minds and our lives, there'll be people that we find that will listen. And we pray, Heavenly Father, you would raise up this congregation and our generation that remains for the great fight. Because, Heavenly Father, we know the day is coming when this world would be no more. You'll come and claim that church, that great resurrection day, and one day you'll present it to, to the Lord God when he sits on the throne. May we be in that number then, Heavenly Father, safe and secure throughout all eternity. We're thankful for everything your Son ever did. For He's come to this earth and willing to endure all the persecution, but to teach these lessons and to give His life in our place. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the gospel, for the message for the church that He bought with His blood. And may Heavenly Father, you bless Wood Day on the days ahead and days ahead like you've never done before. As a prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 11, closing verses. Come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. That's what we're encouraging to do, folks. You may have Bible questions. You may realize in your mind and heart you're not where you need to be. Some know enough to know to respond in humble obedience, to become a child of God today. They're at that point, you're at that point where you know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He died in the cross for you, that His Word is real. 
We can find in the New Testament his life was there. Almost half the New Testament tells of his life, what he stood for, and what he challenged us to believe. You're at that point, you understand that. And you're wanting to change the direction of your life. That's what repentance is, is a change towards the Lord, away from self and sin and Satan. If you're at that point and willing to make that confession, knowing that Jesus is the Christ with your lips and with your life, will take and wash your sins away. You'll be a precious child of God, a New Testament Christian. Nothing more, but nothing less. It's His invitation. If you've declined it, why not today, this hour, make everything right and become a child of God? For those of you who in times past did that, but the deceitfulness of sin and got back into the world, but the blood is still there, ready and able to forgive you again, to walk out of that door. Everyone here that's of an accountable mind should leave and walk out that door in a saved state. Nothing to be gained by delay. And so I'll ask you the question. Pilate, in Matthew chapter 27, what then shall you do with Jesus who is called Christ? Some say, let him be crucified. And some time later, Peter stood up, the Pentecost, and made the charge. The Lord hath made the same Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in the heart. What shall we do? If you're at that point asking that question, we told you what you need to do. Are you willing to do it? We well, hope you will. As together we stand and sing. Will you come? Jesus waiting, waiting at the door. All the knock gently, softly o'er and o'er. Hear him soul and open. I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting, knocking at the door. Soon he'll cease his pleading, yes, forevermore. Come, poor soul, obey him. I am time in our service now that we partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, perhaps the singing of this song would help us to better understand, to get our uh, mind on uh, what we're doing at this uh, present time. 386. 386. <clears throat> Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth below? Where men his grace would not receive Because he loves me so He loves me, he loves me He loves me, this I know He gave himself to die for me Because he loves me so why did Savior mark the way and why temptations flow? Why reach and toll and plead and pray because He loves me so? He loves me, He loves me, He loves me. Why through his strength? 
trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loves me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. You might be one here this morning that is visiting and wondering what this act of worship is all about. We come together the first day of every week, which is Sunday, as they did in the first century as we read about the Bible in Acts 20 and 7. They come together to break bread, meaning to partake of the Lord's Supper. What you may ask is this all about? I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the words of the Apostle Paul, who was speaking on behalf of Jesus what he said prior to his death on the cross. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is, a, is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Keep in mind, this was shortly before Jesus died a horrible death on the cross. Why? Because it's the song we just sung, because he loved us. Put yourself in his place. You're getting ready to die this horrible death. But even worse than that, Jesus knew he was going to be separated from his father during that time that he took the sins of the world upon him. Put yourself in his place. Would you be focusing on this supper that he instituted? focusing on why he was doing it, and it was because of the love he had for mankind. That was the reason that he came to earth to seek and save the lost. He was focusing on us and what he was getting ready to do for us. This is where he instituted what we're going to partake of now, the fruit of the vine, the bread. The bread which represents his body, the fruit of the vine which represents his blood. Before we do that, I would like for, for you to pray with me to thank God for this opportunity to partake of this act of worship. Our Lord and Father, God in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to come and partake of these emblems on this first day of the week to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us. Dear God, we thank you for the bread which we know represents his body. We thank you for the fruit of the vine which we know represents his blood. Dear God, we pray that we partake in a manner that is pleasing to you. And again, Lord, thank you so much, so much for that great sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us. For it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. For those of you who may not be familiar with the cup that we have out in the foyer, if you have not gotten one, uh, we will see that you do get one. Just raise your hand. But you take the first, it's got a small tab on the top, you pull it off to get to the bread, and then another small tab under that for the fruit of the vine.
Is there anyone who has not finished? Another act of worship we partake of again on the first day of every week as we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, where they came together to give back to the Lord what He has so graciously given to us. We read about <clears throat> that giving also in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 about the attitude and the reason for why we give back. Apostle Paul says, starting in verse 6, chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have abundance for every good work as it is written. He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Skipping down to verse 12, for this administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving, thanksgivings to God. We're giving back a portion this morning to God that already belongs to Him. Everything we have comes from God. Every good and perfect thing comes from God. Why do we do that? We just read about one of the main reasons, and that's to aid those saints that are in need, to give back to the poor, those who are in need, but also to carry on the work of evangelism and many, many other things that require us giving back with a cheerful heart what God has blessed us with. Some people has the attitude, what I have, I work for. Let me ask you something. Who gave you the ability to do that work, as well as many, many other things that God has provided to make it possible for us to have what we have. Giving back with a cheerful heart should not be hard at all when we genuinely thank God for what He has given us. Please pray with me. Dear God, we again come to you in prayer, thanking you, Lord, at this time for the many, many blessings that you have given us, especially the spiritual blessings, dear God. Dear Lord, we love you so much and thank you so much again for all that you do for us each and every day. For it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. If you would like to give, the, the baskets is next to the doors on the way out. Thank you very much. Everyone stand, please. <clears throat> Well, I just lost the place real good. Four hundred seventy-two. Four hundred seventy-two. We're saying the first and last sentence. The Lord's my rock and Him my hide, shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in the weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in the weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Divine, O oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Before the closing prayer, let me make two quick announcements. The Bible class fellowship that normally takes place in Robert Taylor's on Thursday morning will be this week on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. And also, the young man that's passing through that needs to arrive, lost transportation, needs to get to Rutledge. If you'd like to help me, I know.
Let us close in prayer. Our most heavenly Father, almighty God, we're humbled and thankful, Father, that uh, we can meet again this time and worship in spirit and in truth. We pray that our worship may be a sweet aroma to, to you and that we may have honored you by the way that we worship according to your word. We thank you for the lesson, Father, that we've been given this morning about, uh, about evangelism and about reaching out to our community and, and to the people with whom we live and work. Help us to have the courage, Father, and the uh, love to do that with our, with our neighbors and, and with our family. We pray, Father, also at this time about this, uh, for those who are suffering from this, from this virus and sickness that's going through the world and through our land and, and through our community, we pray that it will end as soon as possible, that uh, you can have your healing hand on those who've been afflicted by it, especially those in our, uh, in our congregation. We thank you, for, Father, for the blessings, the physical blessings that we receive from you, and we continue to enjoy each and every day. But we pray for those of our number that are sick uh, from various illnesses, that they may be healed, that they may be, uh, be able to repur- return back to us, worship with us, and continue the, the work of the church and being a blessing to our family. We pray, Father, for the, the spread of the gospel in this community, and we pray that it may continue, that we may soon be able to reach out to those who we've reached out to earlier this year and uh, hopefully bring some souls to Christ. Be with our, our armed forces, those around the world, be with, our, be with our police forces, protect them, keep them safe. Father, we pray that uh, you pr- we pray also for your forgiveness for our sins as we may forgive one another, bring us safe uh, home and, and back again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.